Producer dude, here we are again. You asked me for a fishing report today, which I reluctantly did, so everybody can check those things out. But um, I kind of dug deep again here. This is a different deal. You know, we've been kind of getting a, a wide array, almost an eclectic mix of guests. Is that fair? It's Yeah, it's been some lesser known people and some really well known people. And then we've had like just some interesting people in the middle that have done things that maybe young guys don't know and older guys would or, or regional guys. But we've got a guy that pretty much everybody's going to know. We've got Brandon Palinet today. Yeah, I've even heard of him. Yeah, he's a big name bass guy. But guess what? We're not going to talk about bass. We're not going to talk about bass. We're going to talk about his RV. Yes, we've also because we've learned we, we look at the things and people don't want to hear from bass guys. We've we've done that a little bit, but um i think that we're going to talk about some pretty interesting things that people aren't going to see going brandon definitely thinks a lot differently than most guys so um i have you chime in a little bit too and keep us on track but i think this is going to go a much different direction and let's just say 18 pound walleye 18 pound walleye 18 pound three ounces actually that's what we're going to talk about Welcome back to the Big Water Podcast. Today, we did something that some of you guys are going to be a little upset about, but you're just going to have to bail. You just, you don't, just hold on. Don't bail. Hold on to it. Because we've got a bass guy on. You know, green carp, you know, ditch pickles, whatever you want to call those things. But I'm, I'm going to bring this back, so you guys got to stick with me on this. We have the man, the myth himself. They call him the prodigy, Brandon Palnick. Welcome to the Big Water Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here uh, with all my fellow anglers, right? We can all get along on the water, right? Yeah, we can. There, there's something, it's just funny, producer, if you can jump in here on this one. There's something about, we've had like guys from Bassmaster on. We've had a bunch of guys that I just am friends with, you know, that are known as bass guys, well-known guys. And they, it just doesn't do as well, or we'll even get comments from people like, hey, w w what's up Why with bass? this? I'm what like, are you doing with bass guys? Why are we talking bass? <laughs> it's so funny because normally, you know, with pro staffs and things like that, me and you have been on a lot of the same pro staffs uh, through the years, yeah. different things. And, you know, it's always like when I walk in, it's like, oh, it's the walleye guy. You know, like Van Dam's <laughs> like, oh, it's the walleye guy. I'm like, you know what? Yeah. Stink you, but I, I'm a closet smallmouth guy. I'm here to say it. I really, really like smallmouth, and I, I can tell through some of your stuff and obviously some of your uh, adventures and wins and money that uh, smallmouth been pretty damn good to you too. Yeah, smallmouth have treated me good over the years. And, I mean, I grew up in a part of the country that has a lot of smallmouth in it, and so I grew up chasing those little brown creatures. Yeah, they uh, – that, that's fun out there. So you're from Idaho originally and still making that big drive all the time. That's That's got to be a hard deal, man. Just the logistics, but also, you know, like some guy like, let's say, Swindle, you know, lives on Gunnersville. He can kind of sneak out and do things a little easier. Or do you got a lot of closet stuff back there that, you know, good lakes that people don't really know about, kind of sleepers? We do have some sleeper lakes. And it's kind of started to get out more and more. Uh, my home lake which is Coeur d'Alene Lake. That's kind of the most well-known one. It's been in like the Bassmasters top 100 lakes in the country uh, a couple times. And I think just because it's so far away from everything, normal bass fishing that it just still doesn't get the pressure, but it, it probably gets 10 times the amount of pressure now as it did even maybe five or six years ago. Uh, you know, there's been a lot more people move up here and just a lot more guys starting to bass fish and there's nothing wrong with that. It's great. You know, we're just known for trout, salmon, kokanee, all more of your cold water species because we're so far North, right? I only live two hours from Canada and I, you know, this spring, I know of two tournaments where it took over 30 pounds for five fish. You know, I wow. think it was 30, 32 one day and 33, almost 34 pounds the next, uh, you know, and those are hundred percent Northern largemouth. So, Whoa. you know, for, for a Northern strain largemouth to get that big, you know, where they're catching eights and nines pretty, I, you could say pretty regularly, uh, is impressive, you know, and I think a lot of that's just due to the fact of how much trout and other species we have. Totally off, off topic and not to get too political, but I have some friends in Coeur d'Alene, actually. And, you know, they, they're, that whole Cal, that California invasion, they're not so happy. At, you know what I mean? Like, well, 
I think anyone that's like born and raised in Idaho thinks that if anyone comes from another state, it's an invasion. Uh, that's just kind of how it is because, you know, you think about, I think Idaho, I could be wrong on this, but I believe Idaho has more public land in it than any other state in the country. Yet we only have like 1.5 million people in the entire country, in the entire state. And so we're used to not having a lot of people around and to the point of a bunch of California people moving in, I don't blame them, right? Like I would want to get out of California if I lived there and I would want to move here. Except um, for when they, they raise your prices and then bring the same shit here. <laughs> um, oh my gosh. Well, that's the thing is like, we just, if you're going to move here, just understand what you're moving into, right? Like we love to be outside. Um, you know, like it, it doesn't, the people here are not apt to change very much for the most part. Actually, uh, funny story about, we're talking about Idaho and we're talking quite a way south of you, but producer dude, I don't know if you remember this when you were sh editing the, uh, the footage, a guy came up to me in the parking lot where ice fish and cascade last year, like almost, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, eight, nine months yeah. ago. And a guy like walks up to me, he just looks at me like I'm an alien and he goes, what the? are you doing here <laughs> that sounds about like, right and i was like pardon me and i then i immediately kind of knew like okay this guy's going he's like you know we had a michigan trailer plate and an ohio you know um truck plate yeah and uh, i looked at the guy said listen dude i ain't from california and uh you know i'm not i'm not moving here okay like you want to ease up because i'll give you a knuckle sandwich <laughs> but i was like man i think of idaho as being nice and wholesome this dude went out of his way to walk up to me and just i was like <laughs> What the well, hell? yeah, and that area is probably one of the worst. I mean, just as far as like prices rising up, right? Because it's in the middle of, the, of nowhere. Obviously, you've seen it. Like yep. you're somewhat close to Boise there around Cascade, but yep. it's really just like small farming communities in the middle of this valley surrounded by mountains and the house prices and everything have just went crazy there because of, you know, people moving there and they're not even their permanent residents. They're just summer house, summer homes, but they're million dollar summer homes. So, you know, again, cause it's a small world here, not to change the mm -hmm. subject, but you know, I think it's Hayden Coeur d'Alene, you know, I've got some people that I know. Okay. And they mm -hmm. told me originally, cause I always ask guys like, how did we get here? You know what I mean? Like here's some ginger faced kid. I've been in the fishing industry my entire life. I've never had a real job. You're kind of the same way. Right. So I heard you wanted to be a snowboarder first. Is there any truth <laughs> to that rumor? <laughs> That is true. Actually, See, I, uh, I have spies, pal, Nick. You do. You do. You've got spies right in the backyard, it sounds like. And uh, yeah, I grew up. Oh, gosh. I started snowboarding about six years old. And my mom was on the ski patrol, but she was a snowboarder. Um, so oh. her and her friends were actually some of the first like ski patrol people to be certified on a snowboard because back then like they had to go through all these hoops to prove that they could actually get somebody down the mountain safely with the toboggan uh, and so i spent you know nearly every friday saturday sunday on the mountain when i was young and that's what i wanted to do for a living you know before i kind of fell in love with bass fishing um, and still to this day, I love getting on the mountain. I just don't get to do it nearly as much. That's not like a true old, story. The old X games. Yeah. So I, I've got some more that are a little more embarrassing, but we'll hold those off to a little later, but oh, great. So <laughs> you see how I roll. So, I mean, I joke about hating bass, but it's actually really true. So let's talk about some walleye stuff because here's the thing yeah. that interests me greatly. And anybody that's listening to this, you know, my kind of guys that follow my stuff with walleyes, they're like, they don't want to hear about green carp either. So the walleyes out there you guys got some giants and i see you blade baiting them up which is a favorite thing of mine i don't mm -hmm. really talk about that a lot either producer dude's seen it though so w tell me about you don't have to give any deep dart secrets away i know you're not going to anyhow but give me give us a little insight because none of us are going out there we don't even need to name bodies of water or whatever but what can yeah. realistically happen out there when we, we all know about the columbia river but people i don't know think know that hey these watersheds that are pretty close to this got some just giant donkeys in it yeah, I mean, there was really before I made the elites, we did it a lot. Uh, I just don't have the time to go do it as much now, but we used to chase walleye 
really all winter long, right? Because that's when we felt like they were the biggest, they were the fattest, right? They were, they would start staging up pre-spawn January, February. We'd see those bigger females start moving up a little bit shallower where we could target them. And I mean, we caught some giants and, you know, I mean, it wasn't, there was a stretch there where it wasn't uncommon for us to catch five or six fish over 13 pounds in a day. Oh. And, and it was, uh, I mean, the biggest one I've caught to date is 18 pounds, three ounces. Oh, so what's your state? Was, what's the state record? Uh, where I caught that one, I caught that one in Washington. So anywhere else, it pretty much would have been a state record except for the state that I caught it in. So was that, uh, can I ask, was that the Columbia river? It's a section of it, but it's not the section that is most publicized, right? Okay, That's so, most known for it. So stopping for one second, producer dude, so you understand this out on the Columbia river, which is like a trophy walleye fishery, but it's not because they literally encourage people. Cause there's no limit to throw them on the bank because the trout snobs are like, you're take the walleys are taking over, which they're really not, but it's just mm -hmm. a trout snob deal. Is that fair? Yeah, we deal with that all the time. And it, it's, that's kind of why it's not as good as it was then. Uh, we've seen it kind of come back a little bit, but they were netting a lot of them, you know, and they had bounties on the walleye. So that, uh, weren't, weren't they I paying like 20, 20 bucks a fish or something? The state was paying you to have heads or something. Uh, well, not everybody could do it. And it was really just a lot of the tribal stuff that could do it over there. Um, but it, that was, that was a bummer to see just because I get where they're coming from, but it wasn't having the impact on the trout and the salmon like they thought it was, right? There's a lot more factors that go into that than just walleye. And saying there's politics and fishing. <laughs> well, I don't, there was a lot of, there was a lot going on more than just walleye killing trout and kokanee. And, uh, you know, we, like I caught that one on a blade bait, that 18, three. So, you know, that's one of my favorite ways to catch them. And then the other way that we caught them is we caught them on swim baits, uh, which is something that I don't see a lot of walleye guys doing, but we were throwing seven, eight, nine inch hard body swim baits at night. Um, not trolling for them. We were casting for them, but we we're imitating the trout that these walleye were eating. Um, and I think we were, gosh, we were up to, I think like 15 or 16 fish over 16 pounds. And we Holy hadn't broke shit. 17 until I caught that 18. Um, but I mean, we had, I don't know how many over 10 pounds, like 50, 60 over 10. Like we just quit counting if it was over 10 pounds. Producer, did could we end this podcast right now? So I go cry? <laughs> Yeah, because you get come on you out. Ten pounder, man, you're like you're. Well, I mean, nine. A, a ten. I mean, we can. You know, I catch over a hundred a year in Erie. I mean, that's a big fish, but like that is a different level. The biggest thing that we realized is that it was all based on forage for us, right? The trout and the kokanee was what made these walleye grow wide. Right? I mean, the one, the biggest one that I caught was. It wasn't the longest one we ever caught. It was only 33 inches long, but it was 22 inches around. And you only get that from the right forage. Uh, they don't get that way by chasing perch and shad around, right? They have to have a good vitamin T is what I and like so, to call it. And so explain to these guys, when you say the kokanee, which is basically like a small salmon for lack of a better description, Yep. explain how big that these fish that they're eating. A lot of the ones that they eat are kind of in that four to six inch size, but then as those walleye get bigger, right, they want the most bang for their buck. They're no different than a bass or a northern pike or, you know, a predator species. The bigger they get, the more bang for their buck they want. Uh, they don't want to, the less energy they can exert and get the most out of it, the better. Uh, and so what we realized is that as those water temps cool down, we would follow where the bait fish went, right? The kokanee and the trout, they would get up closer to the banks. Well, walleye, you know, by nature, like to live deeper in our bodies of water, we got real clear water. Um, 
and in the summer they would suspend and they get harder to target but in the winter right they're feeding up to get ready for their spawn it just happens earlier than our bass and so we would target where these fish were staging up and feeding and intercepting the bait fish um and it you know that just happened to be in the cooler months you know some nights it would be five degrees outside all your guides are freezing up but you're looking for that one bite uh, and that was the thing is that we could go out and throw worm harnesses and catch you know 30 40 50 fish a day but most of them were this big and the baits we were throwing were this big <laughs> trying to catch those big ones you know that were really our goal was we called them teenagers so anything 13 plus is kind of what we were targeting and we just learned that you know those bigger fish they didn't live in those giant groups you know they were in smaller packs uh, where those big females would kind of stage up and feed on these bigger trout or kokanee which is pretty much just a landlocked sockeye salmon so do you think that generally speaking when the mass of these fish were coming in were those giants shallower or often the haunts on the deep edges compared to the the average even middle-aged fish let's say six eight nine ten pounders i would say on average they're shallower right i would say most of our fish would come from 25 foot or less or 30 foot or less and at night some of those fish were you know five to ten foot but the difference was is that they had really close access to 60 70 80 foot of water right and so they had these steep breaks that they could move up and feed and then slide out there and suspend over deep water if they wanted to and that was the big key for those those bigger fish right they had to have close access to deep water generally they were shallower than the general population and they had to have good forage base and i you know i think like back here you know i live right on the shores of lake erie it's about 10 feet that way and <laughs> it, it's it's amazing that you know from a guide standpoint and even when filming and doing things for shows when they're like oh yeah we want to come and get an eerie giant you know we want to get a giant we want to catch a bunch of big fish and they're not going to be 15 16 pounds most likely right yeah but, but it's the same thing of like an hour in somebody's going to be like okay let's just go get some eaters or hey let's just get some photo fish yeah. you know and it's just crazy to me that I, do you think that a lot of these guys even people that are out in your neck of the woods when that bite was going you i, I can't i'm gonna go out on a limb and say most people weren't catching fish like that so was it because you were geared up properly or just because you continued to throw those when you knew there's going to be fishless days or nights and you were willing to to risk that because you didn't really care yeah it was all just about the way that we targeted them right i mean it any fish that you target if you're targeting the larger than average fish in a body of water they're just going to live different i don't care what species it is uh, because they don't want to fight for food right there's only so much biomass that can live in an area and those larger than average fish are going to live in smaller groups and they're going to do things a little bit differently and we weren't going there to catch them to eat them right i mean we released all those big ones uh, and if we happen to catch a few smaller ones, we may cook a few up for lunch or, uh, you know, for dinner that night, but we would stay the night over there a lot of times, or we would get off work, drive over there, fish all night, come home, sleep for two hours and go back to work the next morning. But it's, it's usually, it's that kind of stuff that keeps guys from doing it because it's not easy. You can't just go out there, kick, put the kicker down and just troll and you know when you get a bite you just reel it in you know this it took a lot more dedication a lot more prep work to be able to target those bigger fish spot lock would have been awful nice back then right <laughs> spot lock would have been nice yeah interesting yeah i mean how so did you catch many of those i mean let's say even three four five pound fish on those 10 12 inch baits or whatever they are no not really i mean honestly the smallest we would catch eight pounders usually you know those were like our smaller ones um, and i would say on like an average night you'd catch one or two of those and then you'd catch 
you know, one that was kind of around that like 10, 11 pound class. And then you might get one or two bites that was 13 to 16 most of the time. I, I'm, I'm intrigued right now. I never thought a bass guy could get me intrigued, but <laughs> so of, of those 13 and above were most of those caught at night. Do you think that that uh, aids you? Uh, majority of them were. And I, I think it's because, um, you know, I think the walleye, their eyes are more light sensitive, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. Correct. But Even they're more I, light I, sensitive. And so I, I think that played into it a little bit, but the biggest thing was the forage, right? The cooler water and at night, those trout and those kokanee would push up and they would cruise those shallow flats. And that's what brought those walleye up. You know, that's what would bring those bigger fish up to those places. Now, like, the biggest one I caught was during the day on a blade bait. Uh, and we caught a lot of fish that were over 13 during the day. We'd catch them on blade baits, uh, you know, and like jig heads a lot of times with plastics on them. Do you have a favorite blade bait? Uh, the For one that? I throw is called the Norisada, Norisada blade bait. It's a guy out here that makes them. Um, paints them up and we pretty much always caught them on silver or uh goby color it's pretty much our two best colors interesting yeah it's always funny blade baits are i love them and it's you know up until recently it wasn't a sexy thing or you know a lot of the major manufacturers didn't have them and it mm -hmm. seemed like so many of them were regional you know what i mean and it was always this guy that makes them in his garage like in the mississippi yep. river there's a guy that makes them up there for a pool three four five and then there's guys down here in the great lakes and um yeah i don't I, I think they're becoming mainstream enough now that you're seeing a lot of the bigger companies that have one um or hybrids or or something that kind of fits that category you throw yours on a spinning rod or a baitcaster it depends you know it dep if if we're vertical fishing because for me i see a huge difference between putting throwing it on mono or braid right you so, land way more on mono well, not even a landing thing, but just the, um, it, it's like two totally different things. If I'm, I'm assuming you were fairly deep and were you vertical jigging those, those, uh, blade baits? No, we no? cast them all. Cast them all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, like for us, a lot of what we're doing in some of the current is we're vertical fishing. Right. But yeah. then there's like the bass style, like, cause we fishing for smallmouth, like, you know, the silver buddies, or we've got mm -hmm. one right made literally right down the road called, which is one you might want to look at too, called the vibey. Um, which is kind of unique. Um, there's another one, Captain Jays, that's here that they both work really good for smallmouth. But you have to like cast those out like on a, almost like a 45. Like you don't want to cast those as far as you can and mm -hmm. kind of just get that swing or that little bit. But um, it's amazing at how many times um, that the mono really, really makes a difference. I don't know if it's we're setting the hook too much or it's the slower fall rate. Um, obviously, the landing percentage is better on mono. At least I think it is. Yeah. What's, what's your take on the whole blade thing? Uh, I throw it on a spinning rod because I feel like my hook set is quicker. Um, you know, when, when one eats it on the fall, I feel like I'm in a better position most of the time than I am with a bait caster. Uh, and, you know, it may only be a split second, but I feel like it makes a difference. And I've got a little bit better control over it. The other thing is our guides don't tend to freeze up as much right you've got a little bit bigger guides on a lot of your spinning rods so when we're fishing them in that yep. super cold weather tends to hold up a little better and uh, I, I think you do land more on mono and i think the biggest thing is like sometimes that delay that stretch right so when you go to snap it it it's a little bit slower movement off the bottom and then it goes fast, right? So you get like a little bit of slow movement and then it pops real quick and then it drops. And just that subtle little difference versus if it was braid, you've got a direct connect. There's no stretch and it just goes, you know, and hits the bottom. I, I use a lot of mono, a lot of mono for just various things. And it's guys are always like, you know, because everybody's so fluorocarbon or braid crazy and, but nor here nor there so are you putting a little swiveling up above your deal because i usually tie a little swivel up like maybe 18 inches or two feet uh no we just throw them on a little snap okay but yeah. i mean you got to deal with a little bit more line twist that way 
yeah man we our, our currents out here well i mean if and the columbia river and tributaries you've got that too but the the current thing can be crazy 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 yeah we don't have near the current that you guys have you know the where we're doing a lot of it's more lake based or like we're fishing out of the main heavy current so now we're starting to get, if i ask this question here i'm going to but if we're going to start getting into your pocket there a little bit you may not want to answer this one exactly but like you know you've had really good success on uh, up on ontario there and st lawrence and that stuff like that's padded your pocket pretty good snuck you in a few mm-hmm. big ones right have you ever tried the blades up there for smallmouth uh, uh yeah yeah um and they do work but the thing is is like we're generally there more in the summertime and they do play, but I tend to throw blade baits more as the water temps get colder. Um, you know, I mean, it's, I think a blade bait is underutilized most of the time. You can catch them on it year round because it's such a reactionary bait, but you know, I end up finding myself pretty much locking a drop shot in my hand most of the time there. I, I could see how that would be the deal. <laughs> so k- kind of jumping ahead a little bit. I think the one thing that kind of amazes um, and some of our mutual friends that I always have just said to him, like, man, how do you do that? Is because I, I do a different form of what you're doing, kind of. And you filming stuff like I've watched video, like, even if it's from like Bassmaster or something where you're you're in the middle of battle, you're fishing for 100 grand. And I think you to first admit it's not even the 100 grand. It's the points. It's all the stuff going on. Like you're you're in battle. Right. And you stop and I watch you like go over there and hit a GoPro or, or you know, switch to <laughs> something I'm like how because my producer dude is about ready to bust out laughing in about three seconds. I have a shit fit with him when we're shooting a video that has nothing on the line. It matters zero. And I'm like, I'm not going to miss this fish or do this or I'm because I'm so laser focused that that's the last thing on my imagination. And he is just ripping me about we got to get some production value, asshole. (laughs) And and you're you're in the middle of fishing the classic or something. You're over here like adjusting your GoPro. Like, is that just your personality? You know, I mean, how? Uh, Man. Um. Well, I have a passion for both, right? For competing, catching fish, and then also the photography, videography side. But I think it was just, I decided that I was going to commit to that. And I just had to go all in on it. And it's kind of like, uh, you know, like if a tree falls in the woods and nobody hears it, did it actually fall kind of deal? If I don't get it on camera, like it's harder to tell the story. Right. And so if it takes me a second to reach over there and just hit the button and it starts recording, I may get, you know, a pivotal piece of that story that then sets the tone for the entire video. So are you thinking it does just like Ross said, this baffles me that you're, you're trying to do your fishing and your tactics, but you're also thinking of a story that goes along with it. How do you, how, how do you do both like during a tournament? Oh, it's kind of second nature now. I've filmed every elite series event for five years now. Okay, but let me, let me stop you. Year. Let me stop you. So producer dude, so you understand, and for all you walleye guys out there that hate bass guys like I do, he's got a producer dude called Kyle that's one of his old buddies, and yeah. he's filming from another boat. So, like, he's getting this stuff, right? So you still, you kind of have an out, but yet you're still doing this. Yeah. Right? And the thing with that is when you have another boat, then you have to think about, okay, where is he positioned? Where do I have to take the fish so that he can get the right shots? And so I'm always thinking about that, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, live video guy for Fox sports on the back of my boat, whether it's Kyle filming for our YouTube channel, in another boat or whether it's just my GoPro or it could be a Bassmaster photographer. I'm always consciously or subconsciously thinking, okay, where are those guys positioned and where are they going to be able to get their best shot? Because you know what I, I know learned? like that. What's that? I just learned that producer, I just, this was the worst question to ever, ever ask you because for the next 10 years, assuming me, me Brandon, and said, like, Brandon said, Brandon said, huh? hundred percent like me and him have been filming together for i think this is year 11 
and, and you just and confirmed I, my entire existence with Ross. He did it. In Ross, one Ross just, yeah. yeah, Ross just shot himself right in the foot. I am, I, I am, I'm. Brandon said, Brandon said it's gonna be like I already call my water wife, and it's it's gonna be so bad. And what Brandon can do, and he's fishing for hundred grand. We're just shooting a YouTube video. You think you could do this? <laughs> it's easier Brandon, said than done. Brandon would have brought this on the other side of the boat because I'm always like, you get it. My job is to catch him. Your your job is to get it. So that, yeah. that, you've kind of just shot me in the foot. <laughs> that, was, that was the worst. Sorry I led myself. That. I led myself right into a firing squad right there. Yo. But so, I mean, obviously the GoPro thing makes it way easier than if you would have started, you know, day one when those things weren't at the level they are or what have you now. And assuming Kyle's not there because it's just like my producer, dude, we're down Louisiana here a few weeks ago. Producer dude's doing other stuff for us. And when it's just you and the GoPro or your wife or something, I mean, it's a different deal, right? Like you're trying not to get divorced already, but yet they're going to do things different because Kyle's really mm -hmm. good or, or they're not seeing what you're seeing. Right. So how have you kind of worked some of those things in with a filming? Because I know producer dude's going to ask you this basically in a different way, probably. Oh, as far as like managing other people filming it or just well, mixing yeah, I mean, in the GoPros. Yeah, I mean, I, and I guess on a bigger, because we've asked other guys the same question where it's like, okay, even on, on a different level, do you just go out there and because producers go whenever we leave and it, as he should, and I'm happy he does. He's like, hey, when I go to Louisiana, he gave me my marching orders. Hey, you need to self film this. You need to make sure we get this, 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 this. And I'm like, I don't want to. This is kind of like a somewhat kind of a vacation. We're not really any specific mission mm -hmm. for one time out of. So, I mean, but you just did your little deal to Costa Rica. We all know because we watch all this stuff. And, you know, you're still filming it because it's part of your job and what you do. But do you ever just kind of shut it down or say, hey, this is going to be difficult to get good stuff anyhow, so just screw it? Yeah, there's times that I just don't put a camera on and I just want to go fish and not have to worry about, you know, talking to a camera or worry about getting this angle or that. And there's times that I just want to go enjoy fishing because you can make it feel like a job um you know and, but the the thing that i've learned is that just getting that footage even if it's not perfect is better than not having it at all and that's probably my biggest You're downfall that producer, is <laughs> that, that's one of the things that me and kyle struggle with the most is like we always want it to be at the highest quality possible but then that ends up causing us to not capture some stuff and, you know, to just put a GoPro on looping and plug it into the boat power and just let it run on a stationary mount is better than nothing. Let's, let's roll into kind of the, you know, I'm not going to beat up on the stuff everybody's seen a hundred times, not because it's good or whatever, like the Tundra suite, you know, producer dude, he also slept in the back of his truck at the beginning, eating peanut butter and jelly like me. But, you know, as you run into that, and obviously it, there's a pivotal point where you're going to make it or you're not, or you can sustain things. At what point did the business side click for you? Or did you have some mentors or some other guys that really probably were helpful for you being able to keep going? I think, I think when I qualified, I went into it with a business mindset because I had wanted to do it for so long that I had studied the game and just realized that that was part of it. And I think because I had a passion for the photo and the video side as well, that those just kind of meshed and blended together. And, you know, and I, I enjoy building those relationships with people, you know, if you go back to like interviews from a long, long time ago, some of the first things I said is that I wanted to bring new companies into the sport of fishing, right? Like non endemic companies that would help grow the sport. And, you know, starting at eight years old, like I just wanted to continue to grow the sport and that's the best way to do it, right? Just to bring in more eyeballs, more people, different companies, uh, because our industry sponsors only have so much budget to go around. I mean, being truthful, though, do you think that that's happened with not necessarily just yourself, but as a industry? Because it seems like they come in, they dabble, and then they go, eh, let's go to racing or NFL or something that's bigger. It seems like they just come and go a lot. 
to me. They do. And a lot of that is just the nature of giant corporate companies, uh, right? They'll come in. If you can get one to last three to five years, that's a win. You know, I mean, the fact that like Toyota, for example, has been in the game as long as they have is incredible. Uh, you know, but you could argue they've probably sold a ton of Tundras because of it. Um, you know, I think that there's certain companies that benefit from it more than others. Um, but I think really you see that in any industry, right? Like even if it's NASCAR, a lot of those companies will jump in, the sponsor guy for three years, and then they back out. So, so the business aspect of things, how much has that changed for you? Obviously, it's just like anything, the longer you do it, the more people, you know, the more comfort level. But I mean, there's a lot of bass guys. I still think to this day that are great fishermen, but they still kind of feel that they're getting paid to cast a line and don't do the other things. And some of the pro, same pro staffs they're on. And you're like, that guy's not doing what they're at being asked. Um, how natural is that for you really though? I mean, I know you, you say you have a plan, mm -hmm. but when you get into the game, I think it's just the fact that I put effort into it and I do enjoy some of that, you know, I mean, the biggest thing that I've learned is that you have to align yourself with people and products that you believe in. If you don't do those things, then it makes it feel like a job, you know, cause then it feels like you're selling to people. If you don't believe in it, then you're lying to people. And that's kind of been the biggest thing for me that, keeps me enjoying it or working with those people is that I'm actually very selective and I will turn money deals down if I don't think it's the right product or the right people that I want to work with. And I've, I've, the older I've gotten, the more and more I've even kind of followed that rather right, than not taking deals just for the money. And that makes a huge, huge difference on the longevity and also your credibility. I think I, I learned from a family friend when I was pretty young and he used to say no is a powerful word. And I mean, to comfortably tell somebody no when you're in your own business mm -hmm. is, a, is a powerful thing. And you can't understand that. But now I'm at that point, too, where I can say, you know, this is just not good for me. And it doesn't matter how much money is involved. And, and realistically, some of those, those situations, they're, the, they're not going to have the longevity anyhow. And I think some of the younger guys are just grabbing anything they can. And I understand that to a point. But in the long run, you probably do yourself an injustice. And time, right? We've only got so much time. And, uh, you know, you have to learn kind of how to manage that to where you still have time to do the things that you want to be able to do or the time to spend with your family. And sometimes that requires you to say no to certain deals, um, to know that, you know, there's a, I hate calling it work-life balance. Cause that's like, Drives me nuts. I, have you figured that out? Because if you did, please send the quick it's, notes. Well, out. it's different for everybody because everyone has different work. They have different things they're interested in. So it's it's really just about kind of spending, being able to do the things that you enjoy doing, right? Building a life that you don't feel like you have to vacation from. And the longer you're in it, obviously, the more easier it is to be able to do that because you can be a little bit more selective. Um, but even starting out, I was very cautious about who I aligned with because I'm, I always had a long-term thought process, right? It wasn't about just who was going to pay me the most. Right? There were so many other variables that played into that. You've, you've helped with get the younger generation a little bit, right? And then also like some of your kind of mindset and motivational things like you're like, I know Swindle kind of tries to do that and put that stuff out there, but he's like a whole different level of wacky where yours, <laughs> yours is, is a little different. It's just a little more dialed in. How about that? So yeah. well, talk to me a little bit about that and, and how that actually helps you. I mean, it's not like that's not a sales approach. It does, at least it doesn't feel that way to me. No, my mental approach really came from wrestling. Like you mentioned earlier, uh, yeah, I wrestled all the way from eight years old, all the way into college. And 
I think that mental approach I carried over into fishing, right? As most people don't realize how far you can push yourself um, physically and mentally because they just haven't hit that wall and pushed through it. Um, but you're capable of way more than what you think most of the time. And I, taking that approach, I guess I've just had a lot of time sleeping in the back of the truck, you know, when you're traveling by yourself all the time and you have zero distractions, you have a lot of time to reflect and think about those things. And, you know, I think it's important for people to have a lot of that self-awareness. Um, even to this day, like I, I continually I get more and more into learning about like the psychology and everything that goes into just how we're wired as humans, right? Even to the level of like uh, studying the brain and the neocortex and the limbic brain and how those kind of battle each other. And then I apply it to fishing, right? And like the decisions we make on the water and how how we go about that thought process and those moments that we have on the water, you know, and try to look back at the events that I did well in and the ones I didn't do well in and like, what was my thought process in those? And so having that mental approach to me has always been, I guess the, the most simple way to put it is, is when you look at all the guys at the top level, from a mechanic standpoint, nearly everybody is equal. Right. Some guys might be a little bit better at flipping. Some guys might be a little bit better offshore, but on average, everybody can do everything from a mechanic standpoint. So the only thing that separates the guys that are continually better or rise to the top has to be mental. Right? There has to be a slightly different switch that turns in certain moments that keeps those guys toward the top. Right. Maybe not always winning or it is winning, but they're always making that one little different change that keeps them from having a 70 or 80th place finish. And they're able to turn it into a 30th. I've, I've literally watched Van Dam say a few things to fellow competitors back in the, when he's the elite deal. And like, I you yeah. could just tell they, they were out, they were done. Like he, before even casting, he had that dude shut down. And I'm like, that guy's on a mm -hmm. different level. I don't know if he would be in your top couple for, for mindset, but I would assume. He, he does. And he's got a different mindset, right? He's so competitive and he was so good. He still is so good. I mean, he's the best tournament angler we've ever had. There's no doubt. Like, you know I mean? And he, he had so much confidence right but it be it came from all of his experiences and the amount of time that he spent on the water right he wasn't just given to him he earned all of that and it was it was really cool to be able to see that like i saw that firsthand right or he just looks at you and smiles like you know something bad's about to happen <laughs> good for him bad for everyone else and uh oh. Like I'll never forget some of that stuff. Yeah, that's that look like, oh, he's just being nice. And you're like, oh, that evil man. That evil oh, man. Yeah. So at what point, I mean, I'm not comparing our two careers in, in any standpoint, but I can just say I think we both started at very humble beginnings and I'm comfortable and I, I don't feel like I have to like, is it gonna be here tomorrow? But I still fight like it is, right? Because fishing, mm -hmm. I, I think it's still it's it's fairly fickle, but things are much better for you. You're not wondering if you're gonna eat tomorrow without don't need to get any more specific than that. But do you feel that as you kind of get, you know, farther away from the back of the sleeping in the back of the truck, that you're not quite as hungry? Like, I know you're super competitive. I'm super competitive. But at some point, you know, when now you're sleeping in that nice big fifth wheel, that you aren't as hungry as you were when you're in the back of the truck. I don't, for me, it's not a difference of being more or less hungry. It's a, about the approach, right? Or what you're hungry for changes sometimes. And I don't think that I have any less drive. It just may be a little bit different, right? Like at the beginning, I probably felt like I needed to prove myself a little bit more, 
nobody knew who I was. I was just some kid from Idaho. Uh, where now I don't feel like I have to prove myself as much, right? I do it for different reasons. Um, and I think that's only made me better, right? As I've realized, I've been able to kind of peel the layers back and get to the core of why I actually love to do what I do. Um, and that's, that helps keep that drive. Um, and, you know, go back to the conversation we had about the financial side of it, not making those decisions based on money helps keep you hungry, right? If you're doing it just for the money, eventually that runs out, right? Because you money for me only allows me to be able to do the things that I love, but it's not like just holding money doesn't make me happy. <laughs> and so it, it doesn't do you any good to just chase that. And I think being able to kind of have, have that approach helps keep that drive. And I'm not satisfied with what I've accomplished. I feel like there's always more. The game continues to change. Uh, you know, even just on the video side of things, right? Like how do you continue to be better or step up the video game or the photo game or, you know, your social, social presence? How do you, you know, do things better on the water? And so there's, it's kind of that strive for perfection on those things. Um, and not perfection in a standpoint of like everything's in line, but just perfection of the process of being able to handle those things. So we, we have another mutual friend that you don't even know. And he was a mutual he, friend. If I don't know, <laughs> well, you, I mean, you just don't know that it is. So yeah, I'm, I just I'm don't gonna, know it's mutual. Yeah. He, he may do some t-shirt work or something for you, but yeah. any rate. So, and you know, he, I think I was literally sitting in his office or something when you were talking and he made the comment. He's like, man, what are you going to keep doing? You know, you're, you're doing the t-shirt thing. You're selling this, we're doing this, you're, you're branching out and doing things. And, and you like made the comment, I guess I'll just keep doing this till I suck. You know, <laughs> I think that was like the exact <laughs> word. I just thought that was funny and laugh. But the, but the bigger question than that is, is in all seriousness, you seem like you're a much more planned out guy than some of these knuckleheads I see. So, at the same point, I don't think you can plan past five years because of technology and life and the craziness in this world. But at the same mm -hmm. point, like maybe it's your wife now goes, hey, I'm sick of traveling around on this fifth wheel. And that, that plays on a little bit. Or maybe you're sick of it. Or maybe, you know, that's, you know, the changes, you know, major league fishing, Bassmaster, that whole thing that goes on. And that happens again out of your control. I mean, what do you think the next step for what, where do you ideally see? yourself in the fishing industry i mean even like like a van dam not to hijack this friend but you see a guy like him who's kind of accomplished a lot you know is he going to be host is he going to be the next bill dance right i mean is that where you could see yourself even if it's 20 years from now yeah i think the you always have a plan that you work towards right you have goals that you work towards but nothing in life is guaranteed and things are thrown at us that cause us to adapt and change. And, you know, one door closes and you got to open up another one. And there's a lot of those things that you don't see coming. So I want to say control the controllables, right? Because all the rest of it, you can't get caught up in, right? You have to kind of take your path and live by that and let other people live their path. And, I think for me being able to kind of have that mindset and have a goal, right? Like I've always said since early on when I started, my goal was to be set up by 50 that I can walk away if I want, or I can keep doing it if I want. But I never wanted to be the guy that felt like at 65, I had to keep competing so that I could make my house payment. Right. And I just, I never, I didn't want to do that, right? Because I, at that point in my life, I want to be able to enjoy it. And I don't, if I want to only fish the opens and I can fish the opens, if I want to keep competing on the elites, you keep competing on the elites, but at least be able to have that option. And, you know, whether or not that happens, we'll see. That's a long ways away from now. 
that's another 17 years from now and young buck (laughs) a lot can change in that amount of time you know it's already changed in the first 10 11 gosh 11 years now that i've fished on the elite so um i think you just have to always continually be ready to change right and not get stuck in one thing so we, we have talked about snowboarding we've talked about wrestling we talked about walleye fishing thank god we did not talk much about green carp AK ditch pickles <laughs> but <laughs> leave us with one i mean because we're very appreciative for your time so but i mean i feel like a walleye tip would be something good so that some of these guys that watch my walleye stuff would be like you know what maybe this bass guy's okay you know, maybe I can catch a few fish because of something you got. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> One tip. Uh, I think the biggest thing is like to not get caught up. Right. And this is across the board for any fishing, but it just may not get talked about enough is that having an open mind and not being afraid to fail. Right. And by fail, I mean, not getting a bite. Uh, because that oftentimes leads to the best fish, fish catches or new techniques, new areas, right? Don't just go to the same places, the same time of year. I get this question all the time of like, Hey, I've got this tournament three months from now, right? We'll just say, Hey, I've got this tournament in December. It's December 2nd, 2021 what how should i go catch them like nobody knows because december <laughs> 2nd 2021 has never happened the fish don't know what's going to happen that day we don't know what's going to happen mother nature eh, she probably knows what's going to happen but we don't know how to predict that and so it's all about having that open mind and fishing those conditions that you're presented with right don't fish based off of a calendar use that as a base guidance, but don't say, Hey, it's the first week of May. I'm going to go fish the same place that I crushed them on last year. Cause just like you talked about earlier in the show, your water temps are 10 degrees higher than they should be right now. Right. And so if you were just fishing based on a calendar, you would look at that and say, Oh, we're going to go to this, you know, this area. Cause we caught them really good here last year. The water's 10 degrees warmer. Odds are they're not in those same places because their conditions, their living conditions haven't pushed them to those areas yet. So to simplify it, don't fish on a calendar, fish based on conditions. That's producer. We're going to let him live. That's uh, the squid games. (laughs) You you, you can move on to the next challenge. (laughs) In all seriousness, I really want to thank you for your time. Thank you for tuning into the Big thank Water you. Podcast. Brandon Palnick, you heard it. Snowboarding, walleye fishing, business, life skills, all valuable stuff no matter what you're doing. Thanks again, Brandon. Make sure you tune in to BigWaterFishing.com, Big Water Fishing at YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Producer Help Me, Stitcher, Spotify, Apple Play, Google Play. Got got them. Oh, yeah, you don't need me anymore. Nailed it. Such a challenge to remember oh, no. these things. He what needs was, you. <laughs> we, we need each other. We're a dysfunctional couple. There's no doubt. Thanks again, Brandon, for your time and tuning in. <laughs>